Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar. My name is JJ Rotman, a representative of Orthline, a medical technology company. Today, we partnered with Josh Carter, an orthopedic surgeon at the Midwest Center for Joint Replacement, to hold a seminar to discuss joint pain and available treatment options. Since the seminar is hosted on Facebook Live, attendees are muted. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the comment section located uh, below or to the right of the video stream. I'll be notified when this happens and we'll have time at the end of the presentation to address everything that comes through. Um, so without further delay, Dr. Carter, the controls are yours uh, and we can begin as soon as you're ready. All right, JJ, thanks so much for the introduction. So glad everybody was able to attend. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Crazy times we're living in. Um, we did this episode about a year ago. Of course, that was in person in my office and we had a big table full of food, snacks, drinks, and I uh, wish I could offer some of that to you today, but it's not to be. It sounds like a pandemic got in the way. Uh, so sorry about that, but really glad everyone's attending. Uh, I'm just kind of happy that, well, I guess, number one, I don't have to wear a mask. That's kind of nice. And then second, that uh, if anybody wants to throw any tomatoes at me, you're just going to get your computer screen all messy. And so that, that saves me a little hassle. Um, but I know there's probably two groups of people here that are interested in hearing about this talk. I know that there's a handful of uh, my patients uh, who are interested in probably viewing and welcome to you guys. So glad you're able to attend. Uh, appreciate your loyalty and uh, saw some of the comments that people made in the Facebook posts and really appreciate that. So hopefully this can be helpful and informative to you guys. And then I imagine there's a handful of, of people watching who, uh, who I haven't gotten to meet. And so hopefully this will also be helpful for you all to learn a little bit about hip and knee replacement, maybe some new technologies that help us uh, with putting in parts in well. So welcome to you as well. Um, I think it probably is helpful to know that I'm not, a, I'm not some sort of paid uh, consultant for OrthoLine, uh, but we do do some shared uh, marketing things. But these really are my own thoughts. I'm not you know, pressured by anybody to give you my, my take on any technology. But this is what I think works well for us doing hip and knee replacements. So um, with that being said, I thought I would do uh, about 20 or 30 minutes worth of some, some discussion. Nobody wants to get talked to death. So I'll just go through, through a few slides. The first part, I'm just gonna introduce you to, to myself. Who am I? Who's this guy talking to you? Um, a little bit about my practice and, uh, and where I do operations. But then the bulk of the time, I wanna talk about pains and joints hurting knees, hurting hips. Uh, what do we do? What do you expect? What are some new things that we can do to, uh, to, to put parts in well? So that's the outline of the event. Um, and uh, like JJ said, feel free to leave any comments or questions in the, the comments box and we'll try to get to them at the end. All right, so we're launching into it. So who's this funny looking guy? Well, that's me, Josh Carter. I'm uh, happily married to my wife of 15 years. Her name's Jessica. Um, we've got four active kids, so um, I'm halfway expecting there to be a piano playing in the background at some point tonight in order to, uh, that that's my kids rattling. I've tried to give them fair warning to keep it quiet. I got four active kids. If anybody needs any leftover Halloween candy, I've got you covered. Um, but for the uh, purpose of this talk, I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Um, don't hold this against me, but I did go to medical school at the University of Kentucky. Um, that's a four-year program. And then once that was complete, I went on to Vermont for five years. That's orthopedic surgery residency. Now, everybody who's an orthopedic surgeon does residency. Uh, but maybe more important than that is to do a joint replacement fellowship if we're talking about hip and knee replacement. Now, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, be accepted into quite a competitive program in Charlotte, North Carolina called the Ortho Carolina Hip and Knee Center. Fantastic place, uh, learning from eight different world-renowned experts, really, in the field of doing hip and knee replacements. And for that year, we just did hundreds and hundreds of hip replacements and, and knee replacements, excuse me. So um, believe it or not, about half of all of the joints that are done in America are done by surgeons who do less than 20 per year. Now, I look at that number, our practice, is gonna do nearly 2,000 joints this year. So in contrast, 
I think it's important uh, for someone to, uh, for a doc to have a, a joint fellowship to have a certain level of comfort. So that's sort of my heritage. And then here for the last six years, I've been in Indianapolis and Indy is now home for me, uh, working at this great practice uh, that's called the Midwest Center for Joint Replacement. And uh, I do lots of hips, lots of knees, lots of partial knees, even revisions of joints, which means if things go bad or they get sent to me after, they get, after they're not working well. So there's a little bit about me. The practice that I'm talking about is this one, Midwest Center for Joint Replacement. And uh, you can see there in the photo, um, my partners that work at the practice. Uh, the goofy guy on the left, that happens to be me. And I'm standing next to my partner, Wes Lackey, another joints trained uh, doc, followed by uh, Mike Barrand, joint surgeon as well. And I'm not sure if you can see Todd Bertrand there uh, in the corner. So the four of us round out the surgeons for our practice. Now, it's only been in, in existence for about six years. And this is kind of important, I think. We, we sort of watched medicine head down a certain path. Seemed like it was sort of big hospital systems, big institutions, maybe a little less focused on the patient experience, high touch, people were being treated a bit more like a file folder and a number rather than getting to know a person themselves. And so we, we wanted to, to break that trend. So we peeled out of hospital employment, which is against the trend of private practices, which are getting bought up by hospitals. And we started the Midwest Center for Joint Replacement. And it has been absolutely great. I think people love it. Um, our whole staff, the location, the building, the approach, the patient focus is all something that has been just tremendous for people's outcomes and the whole experience. So why do we exist? Well, we wanna take the pain out of the whole system of joint replacement. So that's why we exist. We got a lot of joints experience, 50 plus years, really leaders in the outpatient joint surgery uh, space. And we have uh, offices where we see patients in clinic in both Indianapolis and also in Bloomington. Um, there's our crew down in the bottom photo, a bunch of smiley faces that we're proud of having on board. Now, 10 years ago, if you would have asked, can you do a total hip or a total knee as an outpatient, meaning not in a hospital, but at a surgery center where a person goes home the same day, uh, you, you more or less would have gotten laughed at. Um, and over the last 10 years, that has dramatically shifted to more and more surgeries being done as outpatients. And it has been wonderful, um, a great satisfier for patients, and it's a safe way uh, that we can do uh, hip and knee replacements. Um, this space has sort of been a, a, a place where we have pioneered. Probably more outpatient joints are done in our center than any other location in Indiana. We've done over 4,000 total joint replacements. That's hips and knees and partial knees. Um, we're able to control the environment. So the staff that work there, we wanna change a protocol, it happens right then and there. Uh, patients really feel satisfied when they go through this program. And I think especially in the pandemic era with COVID around, no one wants to be in the hospital. So to be able to do this at the surgery center, go home six hours later and recover in the safety and the comfort of your own home, uh, I think that's a huge advantage. Uh, we found that that brings in lower infection rates Etc. So this is the location where I do the bulk of my surgeries, unless a medical reason would take us to the hospital. Okay, well, I'll pause there. That's sort of the end of about me. Most of you guys don't want to hear about me as much as, well, talk about you. And so I imagine a lot of you might have things like this, that, hey, I'm exploring this webinar because I hurt. My hip hurts or my knee hurts. I can't really get around and do the things that I've wanted to do. It's harder. Um, my mobility's less. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to get to the nearest parking spot to get to my destination. Um, I'm, I'm trying to dodge the stairs. Let me find an elevator, an escalator. I, I know this. Today I was in clinic and I saw a bunch of patients, but I, you know, I heard this a dozen times today. Hey, I, you know, just have a much harder time picking up my grandkid. I used to walk the dog a couple miles, can't do that anymore. You know, I, I love gardening, but I, I just can't get out and garden. I don't know if that sounds like you, uh, but I think uh, you're likely in the right place. Believe it or not, 
uh, you're not alone. There, there, are, there are many, many people in the same boat. So osteoarthritis is the name of the entity that many people with joint pain have. What does osteoarthritis mean? Well, you know, for a lot of times people throw this sort of catch all term. It's, it's oh, it's just arthritis. Oh, my knee hurts because it's arthritis. But it actually means something specific. It's not just old Arthur attacking my ankle or my knee or my hip. No, it actually means that the cartilage at the end of the bones is wearing out. And when that wears out, you don't have any cushion anymore. And so you have bone that rubs on bone. Now that causes pain, that causes the joint to stiffen up, that causes damage, it hurts. And all those things we just described begin to happen, okay? You're backing away from the activities that you would normally want to pursue. Um, 19 million people is estimated that has arthritis in America. That's a lot. Uh, maybe one out of five Americans over the age of 40. Um, if you look at America as well, there are 7 million people that are walking around with artificial hips or artificial knees. So you're not alone. This is a very, very common problem. It's projected to get much worse as the years go on just because of the aging population and the frankly, the weight and the heaviness of our population. Okay, so there's a little introduction. Now, what do you do? I spend as much time in my office talking about um, talking people out of surgery as I do talking about surgery. Um, sometimes people aren't ready for a joint replacement. Maybe their x-rays don't show bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Maybe they're not emotionally or mentally ready for that. Well, that's okay. There's a lot of things that we do before we talk about surgery. What would those things be? Well, I have them listed out here. Things like weight loss, therapy, motion exercises, sometimes braces or walking aids, sometimes medications like Tylenol or anti-inflammatories like Aleve. Um, sometimes we'll do steroid injections. Very common for us to give those right into a patient's knee right in clinic if a person has early or moderate knee arthritis. Okay, so those would be things we would do initially. However, and I'm sure that a lot of you are looking at this list and kind of nodding and saying, yep, I went through all that and it didn't help. And eventually the joint wears out and all of these things uh, are just not effective anymore. Well, what do you do then? Well, then you're talking about knee replacement. Let me pause on this. We'll just touch on knees first. I'll touch on hips a little bit later on. Uh, we'll focus on knees for the time being. And this is what a knee replacement means. It's almost a bit of a misnomer to say a knee replacement, okay? A lot of folks get the impression in their mind, well, uh, a knee replacement means that you're taking an entire knee out of a person's body and putting a whole new knee back in. It's not really that. We should almost call it a knee resurfacing. Knee resurfacing almost better represents what we do. So I have a little model here. I'm not sure if everyone can see it in this little uh, video window, but this is a nice model. It's about life-sized and it shows a couple things. The parts that we put on for a knee replacement actually look more like this. This is a cap that goes on the end of the femur bone or the thigh bone, all right? I'll show you that in a second. And there's also this one. This is the part that goes onto the shin or the tibia. So these two pieces make up the ends of the bone. You can kind of get a sense of them on that picture. The picture also shows that other things like the ligaments on the sides of the knee, we leave those alone unless they are too contracted. So they stay behind. The kneecap in the front of the knee also stays behind. So what do we do? Well, when we're in surgery, we get into the knee, we clean everything out. That means take out any of the irritated lining of the joint. That means take out any bone spurs, any synovitis. We clear it all out. And once we do that, we prepare all the surfaces of the bone to have new parts put in. Now, the way you do that matters a lot, okay? We use a jig and fix the jig onto the end of the bones that help prepare how we make these little cuts on the end of the bone. The way we do that matters because alignment matters in the joint. If you put it on crooked, it'll make your leg crooked or it'll make persistent pain or the knee replacement will get loose and it won't work for a long time. So the, the, the way in which we put the parts on matters a lot. And I'll come back to that in just a second. 
So what do we do? Well, we take the part for the shin, we glue it into the shin. That part has a little piece of plastic into it. It's like the new cartilage that has been worn out from the arthritis process. Same thing on the femur. We put a femoral part onto the end of the femur so that when we're done and you're bending your knee, you get this smooth motion of metal on the plastic and not bone on bone pain. And that works a lot better. So this really is the standard of care or the gold standard for bone on bone arthritis that's involved in multiple compartments of the knee um, that has failed all those conservative treatments that I talked about, okay? So let's just touch briefly on what does that mean for follow-up and recovery time? Well, everybody recovers different. These are painful operations. We do a million things to try to minimize and eliminate pain. Everything starting the, the, the few even days before the operation starts. So it's a whole pathway and protocol to try to minimize pain. The parts go in, people are walking the same day, uh, using a walker, usually using a walker for the first week or two, transitioning to a cane for another couple of weeks. And then somewhere within that first month, six weeks, almost everyone's weaning off of their assistive aid. Okay. Gets better with time. I see people back in my office then at a two week point for a checkup, make sure the motion's okay, make sure the wound's healing up okay. And then I see them again at three months. And by three months, we check an x-ray, people are doing really quite well. But even that on the timeline of healing, it's about 85% healed by three months. It's not finished. And so full healing takes a year. So it kind of works in these phases of recovery, all right, in terms of the, how, how, how knee replacements get better. But by the time it's done, we expect that your motion, your function, and especially your pain is all better than what it was before the operation. That crossing that point is different for each person. For some people, they feel better the next day. And for some people, they cross over that point at the six week mark, two month mark, and they say, boy, I'm really glad I had this done. Okay, so there's your average recovery time. If you wanna talk about, for reference, when would I return to work? Well, it's the same sort of period. Somewhere around that five to six week point is average return to work for people. And this is an operation that really makes over 90% of people satisfied. I'm glad they had it done. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit more on alignment. Okay. This is a little bit where uh, the device from OrthoLine helps. This is not to make everybody that's watching uh, turn into joint surgeons, but I think it helps you get an idea of what we need to do. If you look at that picture with the yellow skeleton, there's a black line that's drawn right down the pipe from the hip all the way down to the ankle. Okay, that's called the mechanical axis of the leg or the lower extremity. It is important for that line to go through the middle of the knee. You can even see it on that x-ray picture on the right side of the screen. It needs to go through the middle of the knee. That's how we're designed. And so uh, we put the parts in, in such a way to maintain that mechanical axis. For a lot of people with arthritis, you know, one portion of the knee is worn out and it's changed the angle. A lot of you notice that you're more bow legged than you were before. Well, we need to correct that, make it more straight, make it back to a neutral alignment. Some of you notice that you're more knock knee than you were before and it's getting worse. Same idea. We need to make sure that mechanical axis is realigned. So you can't put the parts in by looking at your arthritic anatomy and say, okay, I'm going to match this arthritic anatomy. It'll be put in crooked. And so the way we put the parts in really makes a difference. In fact, a lot of the research that was done on alignment of the parts was actually done here in central Indiana. And even my partner, uh, Dr. Barron, was one of the authors on a lot of these papers discussing the importance of alignment. So... The, the device that helps a lot with this is what's called the knee align. You can see it on this uh, slide. It's that little white box. Now it's put onto a, a pretend bone, but literally that is the device with that metal uh, post. That's the device that we use in the operating room. It's opened up sterilely, okay, with all the tools that we use during the time of surgery. And so that little device has fancy technology, kind of like the accelerometer technology that's in your iPhone. And what we do is sort of like the picture shows, we take that post 
and slide it back and forth to different landmarks on your leg. And as the device feels the landmarks, it reconstructs the axis of the leg. And it helps us put the parts in uh, with just the right alignment that we want, okay? So we use this and, and I can literally watch the device tell me, oh, I'm tipping it three degrees into varus or I'm tipping it two degrees into valgus. Oh, I need to make it nice and straight. And it tells me that in real time. Same thing with the slope, the backwards to forwards angle. All of that matters for this to last for a long time. So it helps us precisely align it. And uh, we use this tool frequently to help us with alignment of the parts. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to just briefly two other common operations here for arthritis. Maybe you've heard a lot about the partial knee. Maybe you've had a partial knee. When is it time for a partial knee replacement versus a total knee replacement? Common question that I get in my clinic. Um, and the answer is this. It's not like we necessarily get to pick and choose. Uh, hey doc, it sounds like that partial knee is less invasive. I'd like that one. Well, the knee kind of decides for us. The partial knee is best when only one compartment of the knee has arthritis. Now that happens not infrequently. Uh, numbers vary wildly on, on how frequent that entity happens. But um, almost a third of the patients in my practice who have knee arthritis only have it in one compartment. So our thought is of the three compartments in the knee, if only one of them is involved, why are, we, why are we replacing two thirds of a normal knee if only one third's damaged or arthritic? Here's a model for what a partial knee replacement looks like. A little tricky to see it on this glass one, but all the work just like that picture is done on the inside. The extra advantage of this is that the ligaments in the middle of the knee get to stay behind. You can sort of see that on this picture on the slide as well. Advantages of the partial knee, it's a little more minimally invasive, less risk to heart and lungs. Uh, faster recovery time, fewer risk of complications like infection, for example. So all of those things are advantages, and we would do that frequently if only one compartment of the knee has arthritis with the other ones looking normal. All right, so there's indications for the partial knee. Lastly, I'll talk briefly about hip replacement. Lots of ways to do hip replacements. Um, I choose to do it from what I think is the best one, and that's called the anterior hip replacement. It's a newer way to do it. We use a specialized table in order to manipulate the leg and twist it into the right position to put the parts in safely. Um, and because of that table, this is, that was only invented 10 or 15 years ago in terms of being used commonly. Um, and so uh, this is a great way to do it because it allows us to approach the hip through the muscles rather than some of the traditional ways that require us to split through the muscles or even detach them off the bone. So um, we do these hip replacements from the anterior approach, goes right between the muscle groups. And when we're done, the retractors come right out and the muscles fall back to where they go. It's a, a great way to do a hip replacement, allows for a quicker recovery time for people. Um, okay, well, at the risk of talking everybody to death, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, what would be your next step? Let's just say, man, this sounds really interesting. I would sure like to know if I'm in this boat and if this is what's causing my knee pain or my hip pain. Well, guys, the magic number I have put there on the bottom of the screen, um, that's just our office number. So you feel free to give that a call. We don't require a prior approval or a referral from your primary care doctor. Uh, we'd love to see you in the office anytime. Uh, that'll actually take you to a human being, believe it or not. And you won't have to wade through a huge phone tree in order to get to the right person uh, because we want to take the pain out of joint replacement for our patients. So um, feel free to give that a call. We'd be honored to help you. Um, that's our address for our Indy office. We also have an office in Bloomington. So if anyone's still on the... Um, on the webinar here. I really appreciate your attention. Hopefully there's no rotten tomatoes thrown at your computer screen. What I'll do now is I'm going to pause and uh, turn things back over to JJ, who's uh, watching all the comments section. 
and see if there's any questions that have popped up that I can answer for you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Dr. Carter. Very well said. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came through here. And I just want to remind everyone that if you do have a question, go ahead and submit it in the comment section. We'll have plenty of time to address everyone today. So the first question here is from Janice. She'd like to know how soon after a knee replacement surgery can you bend your knee? Janice, that's a great one. Great question. Um, there's not a limit. So we can have you bend it right away. Um, it makes best sense for that first couple of days to just let the knee cool down. So I don't think that early on is the time to really push it in terms of knee motion. You're allowed to bend it right away. You're allowed to walk on it, put weight on it right away. We make you do both those things before we let you leave the surgery center or the hospital. Um, but to really work on knee motion, we like to let it to cool down a little bit. So we start on that the next couple of days. You work on it from our practice. We think it's best to work on it on your own for the first two weeks work on it on your own. That way it won't be overstressed by uh, a therapist. Um, and we start formalized physical therapy after that two week point. And then that really helps with the balancing act of not over inflaming the knee and letting the, the incision heal up, but let you keep your motion without getting stiff. Great. Um, another question here from Mo. Uh, Mo's pretty young, he's 39. And he says he feels like he needs a knee replacement. The pain is pretty unbearable at this point. Um, he's had a couple injections previously, but the pain seems to be pretty consistent. What kind of recommendations do you have for Mo at this yep. point? Great. Great question, Mo. So much of this is based on what your x-rays look like. So I would say the next step for Mo is, hey, I need to look at your x-rays. And that's common for everybody. People can have a lot of knee pain, but if the x-rays and the whole picture doesn't fit the right indications, well, you might be one of those 10% that's not satisfied. I don't want that. So if we look at the x-rays and boy, it shows there's loss of cartilage, there's bone on bone, there's been damage to the joint, there's been an area of bone that's died, any number of these things. Well, the age becomes secondary. Okay, the age becomes secondary. That's partly because the quality of these parts has gotten so good throughout the years. So 39 year old, that's, that's pretty young, Mo. At the same time, if it's bone on bone arthritis, it's not gonna get better short of a knee replacement. And so that's what we'd look at. We'd look at, hey, what do the x-rays look like? Examine the knee, that would really take an evaluation. Great. Um, and Mo did have a quick follow-up. He has seen, he's had a couple of MRIs and x-rays um, and he's gone to three different doctors and they've all recommended a knee replacement at this point. So, you know, I know you, you would obviously like to see Mo in person yourself, but any comments on that? You know, it's good, good comment. Um, I, I would agree, you know, that the indications are right. Age becomes secondary. Uh, I've seen knee replacements and hip replacements done on folks in their twenties, even in their teens, if the bone on bone has happened. I've also seen hip replacements and knee replacements done on folks in their 90s, even over 100 years old. It's a matter of what kind of meaningful life does a person have ahead of them. These are such good operations. The age becomes secondary. So if it's the sort of thing where, boy, my knee is really worn out, I've got bone on bone, it's killing me, every step's painful, well, the next step would be to evaluate it for a knee replacement. Great. Um, so this person saw their doctor and they recommended a procedure where a triangle uh, was cut out of their bone to lower one side of their knee. Is that, is that a fairly common type of procedure? Great question. This is called a, most likely what's called a high tibial osteotomy. Um, there's different ways of doing that. The idea is back to that alignment page that I showed you earlier. For a lot of people, if it's too bow-legged or too knock-kneed, the effort was, well, what if we realign that by taking a wedge of bone out and changing the shape of the bone, which changes the alignment? So there's been some data that says that might work for some people. You got to be a little wary because you're, uh, uh, because there's a, there's a lot of factors. Um, the short answer is that is a reasonable operation. I think uh, it's less predictable than uh, joint replacement. Um, 
and it all depends on sort of what, what type of deformity a person has. It's a big surgery to have someone cut a wedge out of your bone, change the shape, get it to heal, has a lot of complication risk. And for a lot of folks, it hasn't solved the arthritis problem. It's merely put more weight on the other side of the joint so that less force is going through the arthritic side. So um, I'm, I would be a little more reluctant to say that's gonna be a home run for you. And that would be one to look at x-rays, look at your whole clinical situation and see what the best thing to do is. A lot of times that's even something like a partial knee. A lot of folks are uncomfortable doing the partial knee. And so they'll try some other uh, surgeries to try to prevent the pain, such as a high tibial osteotomy. So Great. yeah, that's a good question, JJ. Perfect. Uh, so this question is from Jackie. It looks like her husband had surgery on October 9th, and she's wondering when he can get up and be a little bit more active again, when he can, you know, uh, start, start doing some more manual tasks outside okay. and around the house. Oh, I like that. Jackie's ready for the trash to be taken out and uh, some dishes to be done and get the man off the cat. No, I'll tell you that first month is tough. I mean, it, the, especially the first couple of weeks, it is just the sort of thing that you're like, I'm not sure I should have done this. Uh, the first thing to say to Jackie and husband is stay the course. It's going to get better. It's early on in the process. Um, the more full answer is things get better with time. There's the balancing act of pushing yourself enough through the discomfort that uh, we're challenging you and that your muscles are getting worked and that the nerves are recruiting the muscles again and that you're working on motion. There's a balance to that point at the same time without going too far overboard where um, it's going to irritate it more and become more inflamed. So um, now is a good time to start moving forward with that, with more mobility and more activity around the house. Very good. Uh, this one's from Brenda here. So it looks like 10 years ago, it looked like she had 50% of the cartilage left on her right knee. Um, but she's not in any pain at this point. So should she consider looking into something now or, or wait until the pain, uh, you know, is presenting itself is causing problems? Yeah, that's a great question, Brenda. Um, you knew it was already a problem a decade ago. You know, it hasn't gotten better. It's just that the symptoms aren't bad. So there's two main things that joint replacement does. One is eliminate pain. Second one is to improve your function like motion. Well, if you're not having any pain, then one of the whole goals of the operation is sort of taken away. So now we're just talking about, well, is there a major loss of function or mobility or activity that's really limiting you from that? So those are the two goals we're trying to solve. At the same time, uh, things can progress even without significant pain, and it's causing damage to other things that you're not even realizing. So a person has a bad knee. I see opposite sore hips all the time. And I see people with sore backs because whether they realize it or not, they've been limping. It's changing the alignment of their limb. And so they're walking funny. And so there are sometimes downstream side effects that are negative, even if the knee itself has, like it's not as painful. Um, so I think that's one that's worth, if it's been 10 years, that's worth getting an updated x-ray. It's possible that it hasn't progressed all that much. And maybe it's not even indicated to do a knee replacement but it's nice to get a new baseline. 10 years is a good long time to wait. And then it looks like we just have one more at this point. Oh, I'm sorry, a couple more are coming through. This one's uh, an insurance question. Do you guys accept Medicare Advantage? We sure do. Yeah, Medicare Advantage, all the Medicare plans we accept. Um, a lot of Medicare plans are now uh, allowing us to take the patients into the outpatient space. So since January of 2020, Medicare has allowed us to do outpatient total joints in our surgery center and not have, they don't have to be done in the hospital. Coming in January of 2021, total hip replacement will follow suit. So Medicare patients who have bad hips will also be able to be done in the outpatient space, but we're in network with almost all the major payers, Medicare included. Um, another one about combining certain procedures that could be done at the same time. It looks like this person has some issues with their ACL and may need it repaired. Re repaired. Um, you know, could you possibly combine that with a total knee replacement? How would you handle that situation? 
It's a great question. Um, this is again, back to an x-ray evaluation. So if this is a knee that needs a total knee replacement, believe it or not, the ACL comes out as part of the operation. It gets removed. So it becomes irrelevant. The function of the ACL gets taken over by the shape of the parts. Okay. So there's a, there's a curvature in the plastic that functions like the ACL to make it stable. Okay. Now for a partial knee, it's different. A partial knee replacement, you get to keep your ACL. I think that's one of the advantages. That's why it feels a bit more like a normal knee on average. And so if it's an ACL injury, but also needs a partial knee, uh, it's a little different discussion. But knee replacement, the ACL actually already comes out. So you do, you do kill two birds with one stone in that situation. This one is about um, BMI and certain risks associated with having a high BMI. Um, let's see here. She needs both of her uh, knees replaced, but her BMI is a little bit higher. Would she be a, a high risk for a knee replacement? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, a really common situation for Hoosiers, really all Americans in general, and uh, you're, in, you're in a lot of, uh, of similar company, um, are the risks higher? Well, they are. It's been studied pretty well up and down. Uh, the main risks are things like infection and wound healing problems. So those are the main ones that I see if a person has obesity, for example. Um, at the same time, we recognize that losing weight, especially in a substantial way, is very challenging. And for a lot of folks, they're like, I'd love to lose weight. I'd love to go and exercise. It just hurts me to get out and walk. It hurts me to do anything. I don't have access to a pool, which is very challenging. And so um, for many people, we look at the risks. We weigh it, no pun intended, weigh the risks. And then we decide, um, hey, is this appropriate that we move forward, understanding that there is a slightly increased risk of complication due to your size? Believe it or not, some people think that one of the main reasons that obesity has problems with wound healing and infection is because um, a lot of folks that are big aren't well nourished. So some, things, some people think it's not as much the size as it is being well nourished and eating good foods uh, and having good nutrition. So sometimes we can just deal with the nutrition piece and still be able to do the knee replacement or the hip replacement um, regardless of the size. What are those risks? Here's a sort of part B of your question. Well, at our surgery center, the infection risk is somewhere around three out of 1,000 patients. Four out of 1,000 patients are gonna have a joint infection, okay? That's pretty good. That's about four times less than the national average. Um, the same time, if you have uh, obesity, that risk may even double. But what does double mean? Well, now we're maybe at 1% risk of infection rather than 0.3% risk of infection. It's still not very high. Uh, it's just something that we take in mind as we consider what's the right timing to do a knee replacement. So good question on the obesity. Great. And it looks like that was our final question this time. Um, so uh, Dr. Carter, thank you for your time here. And everyone who's attended, I'll go ahead and put... Uh, the phone number to call Dr. Carter's office in the comment section below here, uh, just so you have it in front of you and you don't have to memorize it. If you guys would like to schedule an appointment, go ahead. Like Dr. Carter said, it'll be an actual human um, answering your questions and taking your call, not an automated machine. So with that being said, Dr. Carter and everyone, thank you very much for your time and for attending our seminar. I hope you had all of your questions answered and the, um, the information was um, helpful for you. Thanks everyone, really appreciate the time.